I got a phone call from my youngest daughter Jane three or four weeks ago now I think it was and um, her ex-husband Astrid who just started work on this building site in St Leonard's had asked her to ask me if I knew what a certain quantity of crosses were in this little woodland and he told me roughly where he was working and apparently he was quite kind and said with people he knows I should well <laughs> that's not necessarily the case but I had a guess knowing that at that particular site there used to be a convent school that it was a graveyard for the nuns and a little bit of initial research found out that that was indeed the case little did I know that that simple question when I started digging further was going to get me more into a piece of what I might call investigative journalism rather than my normal walkumentary type program um, but I discovered it was a story that had to be told another one of these things which will just disappear from the place if um, if the story is not told now so let's embark on an intriguing little investigation into the matter of a headless statue and a bunch of crosses and we will start back at the year 1710 outside St Paul's Cathedral having been completed by Christopher Wren he then commissioned a statue of the then Queen Anne to be erected outside in the cathedral grounds and this was indeed completed in marble by Francis Bird in 1712 it was not without controversy because Queen Anne was a Protestant and there were still quite a lot of people in this country and Scotland who felt that she shouldn't be there it should be a Catholic King and the statue was vandalised from time to time and attacked with different bits and pieces. So by 1868 it was actually in quite a bad state. And a long coming gentleman called Augustus Hare, of whom you'll find out more in a minute. And he paid <laughs> a, a rather scurrilous character called Richard Belt in about 1868 to uh, build a replica well this Richard Belt was a real charlatan before he didn't have a chance to do much he was jailed for fraud and all sorts of things so the replacement was actually completed um, by a gentleman called Louis Auguste Malambre now at that point the original statue disappeared and we'll have to come back to the story later suffice it to say that even amongst her own folk Queen Anne wasn't that popular in actual fact her own doctor <laughs> described her as looking like a brandy faced Nan left in the lurch with her face to the gin house and her back to the church but like I say then the original statue disappeared interesting now just to bring you right up to date this is the building that stands beside the plot this is Holmhurst St Mary and this is where Augustus Hare really enters the story. He, funnily enough, has a connection with the previous video I made about walking the promenades in Eastbourne when I talk about the Eastbourne Aviation Company. Because he, for a while, lived at Ersman Zoo with Bernard Fowler and the family who made the monetary grants to build the aviation factory. But Augustus Hare made his money from writing. He was a well-known travel writer and autobiographer 
and in his later autobiographies also talked about meeting with ghosts here. Um, <coughs> the, the workman told Astrid that the crosses were, were witches graves and I suppose that might have been a story told to keep people away, I don't really know. Um, but he saw the huge estate known as Holmer St Mary and decided to buy it. And looking at this picture now, although this wasn't exactly as it was after he'd landscaped it, um, it gives you a flavour of how grand it once would have been. He loved Italy and so built it with uh, Italianate gardens and all sorts of things. Um, anyway, he bought the building and lived there until his death. Uh, I think it was 1903 he died, or thereabouts. And uh, he built additional buildings. They had a quarry in the estate, so he used all local stone to make additional buildings. Um, as I say, quite a large estate, a lot of topiary he had bought in, and he built a lot of different walks and parkland areas, uh, of which we shall see a little bit more later. Um, after his death, the family that owned it allowed it to go into a bit of rack and ruin until Sister Agnes of the community, now I've got to get this right, community of the Holy Family, so Mother Agnes Mason as she became, saw this house and wanted to establish a convent at a place where ladies of all ages could receive an education. She saw this, of course, all the Italian design and all the rest of it, she loved Italy too and she thought, this is Italy. So on behalf of the movement, she bought it and they set about converting it into a school and a convent. They, they built a new convent um, building. They also built a new chapel and a library and classrooms. As I say, it was a huge estate and um, there they settled for quite a few years. They must have got quite a bit of money at some time because in 1969 an application was made to the local council to expand. I promise you we will get to some real video before too much longer but this is more of a story than anything else. Here is the original planning permission and here is a map of the area owned by the convent and you can see how large it was. The yellow oval shows you where the Conquest Hospital is now. The blue oval is where Holmhurst is and the red arrow points to the ridge heading towards Bath. Well access to see the back of the house is not easy um, but you do get an idea from this view of how Augustus here managed the grounds, although this is a very, very small part of what he did, but you can still see some of the uh, Italian sculpture there. Fortunately the main house has been preserved, it's now sort of apartment blocks and that, there's obviously a little family lives there. So it's rather nice to see that this won't be lost. Now after the noise in the background on the last one, I've um, reduce the noise now to give you some comparison as to how noisy it was. This is Holmer St Mary with extra buildings added made of stone from the quarry within the estate. Augustus Hare added to them and you'll see the inscription over the door there. Hopefully you can. Pax Intrantibus Salus Exuntibus Benedictio Habitantibus Peace to those who enter, good health to those who leave, blessings on those who abide. And as we move forward with this particular bit of video, inside the main entrance there are some pieces of stained glass. Interestingly, a couple of pieces from Hurstman Zoo Castle, one of which was from um, a panel of, of uh, 
stained glass from the chapel there. And talking of chapels, this one built of stone from their own quarry. This was Mother Agnes's private chapel. She liked to come here and receive communion in private, in person. As you can see, now preserved as a little private residence. This was a little prospectus that parents of children go into the school might have seen. Indeed, Joanna Lumley's parents might have seen it because she attended this particular convent school. And then suddenly in 1981, they declared they were going to close. Now this actually surprised me because it would have suggested that maybe the new buildings weren't built, but I have interviewed a couple of people who used to deliver to the convent in the 1970s and they reckon that where the conquest hospital is now, yes indeed, new classrooms, new chapel, new, um, new kitchens and that were built because they delivered to them. So the news in 1981 that it was going to close actually prompted quite an outcry locally and I think some people tried to get a meeting together to see if they could keep the school going but um, all to no avail, it closed in 1981 and uh, then of course all the land needed was sold to build the Conquest Hospital which made the nuns very rich indeed I'm guessing. They eventually sold out and went to West Malling I think. Which brings me back to Astrid's question about the crosses. The nuns had their own little private graveyard as we are just about to go and see. Here is Agnes's cross and you'll see at that time it had started to deteriorate but it was still reasonably well kept. Unfortunately as you will see that situation doesn't appear to have lasted long. Well, I'm now standing in the nun's graveyard here at uh, Colmhurst at the convent and um, thanks to the kindness of Mr John Hedger I've been allowed access to it and to say I'm disappointed is an understatement because obviously the Diocese of Chichester, which supposedly owns this, has taken scant regard and respect for it. There is the staircase that used to come down from the convent into the graveyard and you can see all around there are these metal crosses. There's 44 of them all together. However, at the moment we're standing at the boundary and that's what's next to it. Literally, somebody's back garden is going to back onto this. And it's such a shame. Because it's very neat. When it was built, it was very neat, very tidy. And you can see the, uh, you can see the graves there. And the one that, uh, let's have a look. This is the important one to me. This is Mother Agnes and she was the foundress of the cemetery, uh, of, the, of the convent. As you can see there was a nice little terrace built here. Um, there is a large cross to mark the cemetery and we can go down the steps. and into the bottom here where we'll find another row of crosses coming along here so they're all wooden to start with and um, they have been replaced at least by something a bit more permanent but if I come back here now looking down there that bit is going to be somebody's back garden now here is a mystery. Looking down through there, you would think that might be an archway, a stone archway. 
I have taken a still from this. I have zoomed into it. I can't really make out whether it's just a natural phenomenon or indeed it is a stone built arch. I'll leave it to you to decide. But I understand at the moment there are no plans at all to do anything with this, to cut the shrubbery back, to put a, a boundary fence round it or anything. But you can see how originally, especially looking along that way, you can see how very neat little garden, memorial garden this must have been. And although it's looking very forlorn now, this must in its time have been very pretty. Here's some more of the graves here and up in that corner there. I do find this personally very upsetting. I hope they'll forgive me for, if I've trampled over anything I shouldn't. But again there is, there is the cross but you'll see from the material behind, machinery behind, just how close the new development is coming. As I say, I, I thank the, uh, the groundwork management very much for allowing me in here to film. I'm going to have to go now because I've only been allowed a certain amount of time. Um, if there's anybody in any contact with the Diocese of Chichester, who I understand are responsible for this, perhaps you could kindly tell them to get their backside over here and treat this ground with a little more respect. And as I film this on my way to, to work at Bodham Station, I'm afraid I'm going to have to bring it to a halt here and get moving. Now just before I leave the site completely, we're just walking back up to the site office and discovered this in the woods. And the only conclusion we can come to is that this was probably the entrance to the graveyard when it was treated with more respect. But look at these yew trees behind it. Aren't they lovely? Now if only I could speak tree, I could ask them what the hell's been going on here and they would be able to give me an answer. But obviously out of the old convent, and this might predate the convent, this might be part of Augustus Hare's doing with his landscape and of his garden, but it does seem to me that uh, John was right. It's a, a little pathway along through the woodland and as you come round the corner before all this stuff was built up over it you would approach on two or three levels a nice little well-kept graveyard down the steps nicely landscaped and you could treat it with the respect it deserves now it's possibly a playground for vandals if they could ever get themselves in here and if something's not done to protect it I'm very much afraid that's what might happen and it's such a shame. Now this is a, another bonus. Some of the lads who work on the site were just walking through the woods the other day seeing and clearing out ready for marking and we found out that although I can't get an angle to get it the right hey, these are, these two at least are the graves of Augustus Hare's hounds. Rollo and difficult to read that one properly. Something Veer, De Veer. I would guess that's De Veer on that one. But there's also a bit of a mystery up here because there are three more tombs and another flat stone behind it, which we don't know what it really is, but there's one here that's marked Faust. There's another one here that's marked Lewis. And this one is, well it says, looks like it says 
Lucan. I wonder if that in modern English would be Lucian. I'm not sure whether these are hounds, one would guess that they probably are. But it's not the kind of thing you expect to come across in the middle of a building site. <laughs> but there we are, this is history and these will disappear, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Nobody's going to come in and look after this when the building site's finished. It, this is going to be a playground for vandals, I'm sure of it. And again, it's such a shame, but I do thank the folk here at the site for allowing me access to record these before they disappear forever. So, thank you very much, John. I appreciate that. You're more than welcome. You're very if kind. If you do anything to restore these, I will. Thank you. That's good to know. Well, <clears throat> I'm coming towards the end of the story now. And I'm in Elbridge Way, which has been built on land formerly occupied by the convent, the chapel and the library. This is definitely one of the old convent buildings. I don't think there's any doubt about that whatsoever. Definitely got that age to it, isn't it? And uh, as we walk up along here, rather sad, always sad to see when older buildings are just raised the ground but I'm looking at where the chapel once stood and that's not nice there's 200 odd houses going in here and this is where I came the other day and uh, the way to the nun's graves is uh, just down there to the left. Now when they were clearing some of the ground just up round there to the right, I've seen a photograph, I think I'll try and reproduce it here, where they scraped some of the earth off. They, um, they've uncovered what was a marked out car park. we going <laughs> but anyway here we are this is the entrance to the building site and I think we've probably just about come to the end of our story or have we <laughs> let me show you Francis Bird place now Francis Bird that's you might remember when I said right at the very start we introduced this with the statue of Francis Bird was the sculptor who made the statue back in 1712 that sits or sat outside of St Paul's Cathedral. Now I would assume that as this is spelt Francis with an I that this little place is actually named after him. However, my investigations and interviews with one or two people who know a little bit about this place or remember it from times past there's one particular lady and thank you to my good friend Graham Wallace for putting, putting the message across from his cousin Audrey she seems to recall there was a nice lady lived in one of the tied cottages in the convent here and her name was Frances Bird so it could well be named after either but this is where, from what I can see on the plans, the main convent building stood. Although these buildings here on the left, I find a little confusing. They're built in a, a sort of a period style, but they're not period buildings. These would have had to be built in the 1990s, I would be guessing. I don't think they're even the old convent. But no, no, the convent itself was knocked down, I'm sure. I read it on the records. They remain a mystery to me. Suffice to say is I don't think they're as old as they look. But anyway, the statue. <laughs> Interesting I should mention that. You remember, 
I said that it disappeared in 1712, or sorry, not 1712, 1868 or thereabouts. Well, come with me and I've got something interesting to show you. I'm going to stop filming for a moment, but I need to go and take a walk down the road. But uh, I'll be back in a moment. Now Augustus Hare really wanted the original statue, which is one reason why he paid to have a replica made. He wanted it for his new estate at Holmhurst, especially as people like Somerset Moore were regular visitors. But it disappeared and nobody knew how or why. A couple of years later, a friend of his was walking down past Boxwell Bridge somewhere and he saw a familiar looking shape sitting in the back of a mason's yard and it turned out to be this very statue. She has those four figures at the base representing England, France, Ireland and North America of whom she considered herself Queen. The main pedestal had to be left at St Paul's Cathedral, it was simply too heavy to move so he built a new one here at Holmhurst out of the local stone from his quarry and in <laughs> with great fuss the same as you would see an outsized lobe move today it came from there after he managed to acquire it uh, down to Hastings and was erected in his garden sadly since then it has been greatly neglected and as you'll see in a minute hasn't even got a head at the moment but it's a good job I took this video when I did because a week later it's now been protected and you can't even see it from the road so I was very lucky to get here at the time I did. It is being restored at a cost of well over a million pound. Um, it's part of the company's conditions of doing the building work. Hopefully that will sit in a nice little park where people won't vandalise it. I'm not so sure about the nun's graveyard. But anyway that's what it looked like when it first arrived. Um, after it had been tidied up and there's a bit of restoration on it and so that is how Queen Anne's statue arrived at Holmhurst and here is the original statue dating from 1712 it's made of Carrara marble and will be restored with marble They'd started building this up. When I went back a week later to hopefully get closer to it, you couldn't see it. They built a big stone circle or cement circle around it to protect it. But it will be fully restored. And uh, I think that's going to look rather good when it's done. Anyway, it, I was invited up into the offices and um, I was able to actually see and feel the new stone and marble that was going to be used. Well I've been very kindly allowed into the office and uh, I've been told about the restoration of the statue. It's going to cost over a million pound. But I've got a couple of samples here. The plinth is going to be using this wielding stone which as you see has a lovely lovely grain going through it. That's going to look very nice. and. There's the marble, which will replace the lost marble. This is a considerate building with the restoration and I think it, it looks well for the future if we have more firms like this. Now I only had a week or so in which to do this because by that time the view of the statue had gone completely amazing what you can find out in a week so thank you very much to everybody whom I interviewed or asked questions of particular thanks to John Hedger site manager of Statham who allowed me access to the site I suppose strictly speaking we were trespassing but um, how else would anybody get there to record it before it disappears forever I have no idea what's going to happen to it 
John tells me that he's going to try and get permission to take his team in there to do a bit of landscaping and tidy it up. But uh, it would seem that it is the responsibility of the Diocese of Chichester. I hope they don't let it go to rack and ruin because it'd be vandalised before long. Similarly, the stuff to do with Augustus Hare. I have no idea who's responsible for that, but that's going to disappear too. Thank goodness I was able to get and record the story in time. Big thanks also to Sarah at Roots Chat, who has allowed me to use photographs and drawings from the site of the late Chris Swarbrick, who ran 1066 Genealogy. He was quite interested in this, um, this particular site and had a lot of information about it. I've been very happy to sort of update it and bring it into video form. So do have a read of his information in conjunction with my video. I'll put a link in the description down below and hopefully you'll be able to find it. So thank you very much for your patience in looking at this. As I say, it's very different to what I tend to do, but I felt I really had to do it. So thank you very much for looking. Mm -hmm.